All right, so I'm going to pick up where um, we left off in the, present, in the video presentation, which was recorded last Wednesday. Last Wednesday, we were reviewing some terms which we became introduced right throughout early in the semester about how exchange happens between uh, the blood plasma and the interstitial fluid. What we concluded with is that due to the permeability of our capillaries, we can use these pressure gradients to force plasma out into the interstitial fluid. What is that process called? Filtration. Okay. And as well, interstitial fluid can go back into the blood plasma. What process is that? Reabsorption. Okay. So collectively, filtration and reabsorption comprise what? Together we could say what? Bulk flow. Okay. It may use processes like diffusion, uh, for things that are lipid soluble. Uh, particles that are maybe polar can diffuse through the pores, but we also concluded that proteins can be transcytose okay, across the membrane. So the mechanism just depends upon the size and the solubility of the particle. But if we just say if something is moving from the plasma to the interstitial fluid, we say it's been filtered. And if the reverse, right, the pressure gradient pushes, then we can say that product is reabsorbed. What questions do you have about differentiating filtration versus absorption? Again, your textbook uh, goes as a quantification, which is fine, uh, but we know that if something it has a higher pressure and there's an area where there's less, there exists, what exists? A gradient. A gradient. And the particles will be filtered towards their lower pressure. However, that leads us to a question, well, what happens um, to any excessive fluid that doesn't go back into, uh, that isn't reabsorbed? So I'm actually getting ahead of myself, so I'll come back to that question in just a second. Uh, let's just recap. So at the capillaries, we can see bulk flow. Blood will then enter into which vessels? Into the venules, then into our veins. If you recall from our discussion, the blood velocity, even though it slowed down in the capillaries, the velocity is beginning to pick back up a little bit. But what is continuing to decline? Pressure. The pressure. Blood pressure is continuing to decline as blood goes through the venules and the veins. And because we're upright animals and we move about, gravity is going to have a natural pull on the on this blood in our body. So we need to overcome this low pressure, this high gravity uh, experience that our blood undergoes. And so what our body has to do is employ um, some additional pumps. And a lot of times you'll see uh, the little air, the between the air quotes, they're pump, right? Um, we have additional pumps to help distribute blood. One pump uh, that our body uses is called the muscular pump. Physically moving, we learned when we looked at skeletal muscles, it squeezes on the blood supply to, a, to an organ. Uh, so skeletal muscle organ. That solidified why when skeletal muscles become more active, they rely more upon glycolysis. Okay. So our arterial blood flow is declining. But because our skeletal muscle organs get squeezed on, it also enhances the return of venous blood back to the heart. So just squeezing on a, on a vein going through a skeletal muscle helps propel the blood in one direction. Why is the blood moving in one direction and not in both directions away from the organ? The, the presence of valves in our veins. Okay. Because our veins have valves, when a skeletal muscle is activated, uh, it sure might try to propel blood in both directions, but it's really only going to go in one back towards the heart. And so I usually use this as a, um, a kind of a talking point in that this is why um, if you see someone hospitalized, what's the first thing that the, the doctor's going to order? As soon as they can, what do they need to do? They need to get up, they need to move, they need to go for a walk. And if they can't get up and go for a walk, what's prescribed? Someone's going to move them. So physical therapy, or even hook them up with those right, compression, right, systems, right, for example. So we want to get that venous blood 
back to the heart and circulating. Right, enhances blood circulation. So what, yes. what is it like when your leg falls asleep? Does it have any type of feel of that too? Uh, when your leg falls asleep, it's more compressing on the sensory nerve. And so we just kind of, um, they adapt basically. And so when you compress on them, your sensation goes away. If it's big enough, certainly you know that some blood flow is, it, so it can have both on nerves and on your blood flow as well. Um, when that happens, it, the room feels a little bit cold. Not only that's more just because the nerve is completely just sedated, if you will, like physically pressing on it. But uh, depending on how forcefully you're laying on a limb, it can affect blood flow and, and nerve. Um, so physically moving is a good way for your body to bring systemic venous blood back to the heart. There is an additional uh, pump that I mentioned in the video. Did anybody catch the extra, the second type of pump that our body uses to return venous blood besides our skeletal muscle pump? The, it's called the respiratory pump. Thank you. So I don't know that I have this in here for you, so I'll have to go ahead and write this down. In addition to your skeletal muscle pump, we have something called a respiratory pump. A respiratory pump. What that means is, if you recall, when we introduced the respiratory system back in lab, the very first one, we said when we breathe, we create a pressure gradient. We looked at it for just moving air into and out of the lungs. But the pressure also changes between the thoracic and the abdominal cavity in the same concept. When the pressure is higher in the abdominal cavity, that pushes blood up towards the thoracic cavity area. But then when the pressure switches, the blood doesn't go back down again because why? The presence of valves in our veins. So just breathing and moving are ways to return systemic blood back to the heart to continue to distribute our blood. What questions do you have about using our skeletal muscle pump and our respiratory pump to return venous blood back to the heart? Is the skeletal muscle just on the veins? And is it on like all of them? Uh, it's throughout the body. And so there would be arteries and veins that would be compressed. Um, and so if arterial blood flow is declined significant, that's when those skeletal muscle organs would rely upon aerobic respiration instead of, or excuse me, rely upon anaerobic respiration instead of uh, aerobic respiration. But if just physically moving, just like a walk or a stroll, um, isn't going to be enough to improve arterial blood flow. But it is enough move the venous blood back to the heart. Additional questions? All right, so I was transitioning to a second ago where we said reabsorption is picking up, you know, products that have already been filtered or maybe even something that a cell has just made. We'll think about it uh, in an endocrine tissue in your body where it just made a big, large protein like uh, insulin, for example. By technicalities, you would think, well, maybe that's not, maybe that's too big to fit through the pores, and that's not a way to train psychosis. And so our body won't just leave these things loitering around in the tissue. Our body has to have an extra way to pick up these uh, products that aren't absorbed into the capillaries. And so our body has another set of vessels, which uh, are called the lymphatic vessels. You've probably heard of your lymph nodes, uh, lymph glands, right? Maybe you've heard it called. Um, these are along the vessels, the lymphatic vessels. And so your lymphatic vessels uh, do a few important things for us. The first is, notice where they originate. Where do they start? Where do the, where do the, they even start before their capital? They start at the capillaries next to our systemic capillaries. Your lymphatic capillaries are adjacent to your systemic capillaries because they're to pick up what your systemic blood capillaries can't. 
So something can't be absorbed by your systemic capillaries. It can be picked up by your lymphatic capillaries. And this is because the lymphatic vessels are built differently than your, capillary, your blood capillaries. If you recall, our um, blood capillaries, our cells are geared together. We've got some tight junctions and some pores between them. The lymphatic vessels, the cells actually overlap. One another. Oh, so that, and I liken it really um, analogous to like a game trap. You know, so have you ever seen like a um, a wild feral cat or feral cat trap or like a, a raccoon trap or something like that? And you guys are from Oklahoma. I know you gotta know. <laughs> and so it's like a one-way gated system. Okay, the gate will open, but once something goes on the other side, the gate seals itself shut. And that's kind of analogous how your uh, lymphatic vessels work. So if pressure is high in the interstitial fluid, the lymphatic capillaries can open, fluid can enter, and then when that fluid goes in, it's stuck. It's stuck, it goes into the lymphatic capillaries. Maybe stuck's a strong word, but it's, it's going to stay in the lymphatic capillaries. It shouldn't filter back out through the interstitial fluid. And now it's going to return analogous the fluid in the lymphatic vessels, we'll call what? What can we call it? We just call it lymph. lymph. Okay. The lymph is picked up by the lymphatic capillary. It travels throughout different nodes in our body. And just to really oversimplify the importance of these things, this is where an immune check happens. We have a lot of immune cells waiting pop on anything that's a pathogen or perceived to be a pathogen in the body. There's this auditory thing of like all the lymphatic fluid. I mean like uh, maybe the last night. Yeah, it'll all filter right through. Okay. And you've got a ton of I don't know the numbers, but a bunch of cells waiting. And they're just chasing you and they attack anything your immune system's working right. Anything that's received pathogen would be bacteria, virus, or, or whatever the case, or whatever cancer cell, your body will shut it down, or do its best to try to shut it down. That's why you'll feel, if you feel, um, if you begin to start thinking you're sick, and you're not sure, and you start feeling your lymph node kind of swelling up, those cells are mounting a, an immune response to try to take care of it, and they may be fine later, or there's later, and you just can take care of it. Your lymph went through your lymph node. So let's, let's write down what is picked up by our lymphatic vessels. One, we know what I just talked about. What is picked up at your lymphatic capillaries? Well, something that is too large to be reabsorbed by our capillaries. So um, you could say maybe extra as an excessive interstitial fluid that's not ever been reabsorbed. Like yeah, viruses are a great example. It is okay. So I don't want you to think it's just pathogens that are picked up. Okay. This is fluid. This could be water. Let's say you had a physical injury. Let's say you uh, bumped into the table on your way out of the classroom, and you busted your capillaries and you got a bruise. All that fluid is not going to stay in your tissue because you have your lymphatic. So it doesn't. It's not just pathogens that are picked up. It's fluid, it's proteins, uh, solutes. It's just the, and it's an additional route for any interstitial fluid to get back into the blood. Mm -hmm. So, so is it stuff that could get into the capillaries could also it, get into the blood? Yes, certainly. <coughs> because the water could certainly go into the capillaries. Sodium and solutes could certainly go in. Um, so you wouldn't find it just filtering off just protein. Because okay, then you have a big protein traffic jam, basically. So you got to have something for that to, to flow into. So if a pathogen was bigger, would it be more easily managed, or not necessarily? Um, not necessarily. Um, I'm trying to think of a pathogen that would be so giant, deep in your tissues. I think something pretty traumatic would have to happen. Um, 
for that to happen. So um, maybe your capillaries get damaged. So um, most things are tiny, like uh, bacteria, viruses, and etc. Are probably what your body's going to mount an immune response to. And so they're so small, they would have no trouble. And that's why it's easy for once you get an infection for it to go system wide. Okay, so for example, um, if you go into the dental hygiene program, or if you go to the dentist, the first thing they check, or not one of the one of the first things they check is see if you've got an, an open wound in your mouth. Because okay? that's a direct entry into your whole body. You may have a, a tooth infection, but then two days later die of heart failure because a pathogen gets right into your circulatory it's fallen into the right into your circulatory system and attacks internal organs like your heart, for example. Okay. So um, most the point of that divergence is most pathogens are, are small enough that it's still friendly to absorb. I can't I don't know offhand something that'd be so giant. Yeah, but mm -hmm. even then a parasite, I'm trying to think of like I'm trying to think of uh, well, a parasite would be just like a maybe a baby on it, just kind of whatever, wouldn't it? No, I yeah, I'm trying to think of like a I, I can't think of an example where that would be a condition. And so um, the diff the point is broad broaden it's not just pathogens. Pathogens may be in your body and they can be attacked here, but that's not why we have the lymphatic capillaries. They're there really just pick up extra interstitial fluid that was not ever reabsorbed. If there happens to be a pathogen, it can absorb that as well. So the lymphatic vessels pick up extra interstitial fluid that's not reabsorbed. Um, additionally, you'll find your lymphatic capillary is really active in the digestive system where if you take in a high fat diet, or it doesn't have to be high fat, if you just eat uh, lipids, you know, they're so big, they would be too big to be uh, absorbed into your capillaries. And so they get pushed into your lymphatic capillaries. And so the second primary thing that um, your lymphatic vessels do is absorb fat from the diet. Okay. And then put it right back into your layer. Right back into your circulatory system. And then we really just identified a third function as immune, immune function uh, for the lymphatic vessels as well. Does it always go into the veins? Yes. And it'll get redistributed. All right, so those are our lymphatic uh, vessels. They pick up excessive interstitial fluid, absorb fat from the uh, digestive system, and also provide uh, immune function. Okay, and, they, and they do return their contents back into the venous supply and then go right into, back into the blood plasma for system-wide distribution. The next bit of information is going to be a culmination of um, what we've been studying all semester, <coughs> control. Okay, we said... Organs can be extrinsically controlled quickly by way of the what? <coughs> Nervous system. And more long-term control by the hormones, our endocrine system. Okay, so we're going to review some of these concepts which we've been leading up to all semester. The heart, we know, we studied in chapter 13, is definitely intrinsically regulated. We know that. We said, well, it's also extrinsically regulated by the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system gives us, we said, if you recall, the heart is duly innervated. So the sympathetic nervous system does what? Heart rate goes up and also what increases? The strength of the contraction. Do what? And it will also make your blood pressures spike because the resistance. Okay, so we'll come back. Uh, I'll, I'll go through those step by step. But I just want to point out that this, in theory, should be a review uh, from what we've been leading up to. We're, we're kind of hitting our pinnacle using what we've been introduced all semester. So the heart is extrinsically controlled not only by the nervous system, but also by the long term is going to be our endocrine system. So what we're going to do is review um, a reflex arc, which we became introduced to in chapter 10. In our reflex, we need a what? A stimulus and a? Like the 
a receptor and a integration center and an effector organ. Okay. If I want to control the heart, I need to measure, if I want to measure, if I'm trying to control the blood pressure, I probably need what kind of receptors? Barometer, which measures pressure. And they are called baroreceptors. Very good. Those receptors communicate with an integration center we introduced to last week. What can integrate and control the heart? That goes to the efferent supply. Where did it get its control from? It's a vagus nerve. That'd be the efferent nerve. Where would the vagus nerve get its control from? Mm -hmm. The medulla oblongata. There you go. So baroreceptors can communicate with your by afferent nerve to the medulla oblongata, which can select efferent nerves like the vagus nerve to control the activity of the heart. Where was the heart innervated? It's a two part. The SA node and the AV node and the myocardium. Sympathetic nervous system, we said, can influence the heart by changing the, at the nodes, it changes, it changes the, the heart rate, and the myocardium to change the what? The strength of contraction, which changes what? Yes, directly our stroke volume. Very good. But we did see that there was triangular at the end of chapter 15. So we're going to review how the nervous system can control blood pressure by targeting the heart. Then we're going to uh, state as well our blood pressure can be controlled by using hormones. That can change our blood pressure, but it's going to take much longer, longer than a few milliseconds. So we're going to introduce it today, but ne uh, next week, because its target really is at the kidney, we'll talk about this pathway next week. But right now, let's just be familiar that the nervous system can control our blood pressure how? Our nervous system can control our blood pressure. Do what? What'd you say? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the heart is duly innervated. And, and time-wise, we're going to say it's very short-term. It's a fast, right, control. So if I want to quickly change my blood pressure, I need to use my nervous. autonomic nervous system. If I have a prolonged blood pressure problem, my body's going to start calling into action the endocrine system. So let's go through and review how the nervous system controls our blood pressure. Uh, it's not only going to target the heart, like we've been just reviewing, but there was a question is can we change the overall blood pressure? And yes, we can by also targeting our blood vessels. So our effector organs for maintaining quick blood pressure include our heart and our blood vessels. When we target the heart, we affect the cardiac output, and when we target our blood vessels, we can change the resistance, which will influence our problem. Try to fix They most are not all. They tend to be more sympathetically controlled, and but some are. Some are duly innervated, and it depends on where the organ is, receptor yeah. location, and, uh, and, and etc. You're looking at in the stomach versus in the skeletal muscles. So it goes back to the, to the diversity that we studied in chapter seven. There's so many different blood vessels in our body: heart versus stomach, bladder, and etc. So. 
Let's just go back and review this uh, reflex. Uh, figure 1426 illustrates for you where the location of the baroreceptors are. Baro means what? They're measuring, they're receiving pressure. Uh, it's good that they happen to be located in the aorta where the pressure is probably the what? The highest. Your left ventricle is working really hard to push that volume out. Uh, so I need the high pressure to push it all the way out and get the blood back over to the right side of the heart. We also have baroreceptors located in the carotid artery. Why do you think we need to monitor pressure here? So it's going to the brain. And we would all agree that the brain is super duper important. Okay. And so we really need to make sure it's monitored closely. These receptors by afferent nerves would communicate with a structure called the what? Medulla oblongata, okay, as shown in figure 1428. The medulla oblongata is going to serve as our integration center. It's going to compare this incoming baroreceptor information to that point. If your blood pressure is above set point, which nervous system, which subdivision of the autonomic nervous system should be activated? If my blood pressure is too high, which one do I want to activate? Parasympathetic and turn down sympathetic. So if my parasympathetic fibers get activated, we said they act on the heart to slow down the the rate. It okay. acts on the SA node and causes depolarization frequently. So our heart rate goes down. We're no longer overactivating the muscles, so the contractility decreases. My heart rate goes down, my contractility, my stroke volume decreased. What has what has decreased? We haven't target we haven't resistance will be activated here. If I slow down rate and I slow down stro decreased stroke volume, what have I decreased? Output. Cardiac output. I have decreased the cardiac output. Blood volume, cardiac output decreases, so hopefully my the pressure will decrease, hopefully back to But the question was, Will the parasympathetic nervous system innervate our blood vessels? We said most of them are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. Well, a few are, are duly innervated, so we don't see that here. So our blood vessels will probably do what? If my blood pressure is too high, what do you think my blood vessels should do? Dilate. To decrease the what? Resistance. To hopefully bring my pressure back to that point. What if my blood pressure falls below set point? What's going to detect this? Baroreceptors receptors in my aorta and also in my carotid artery. They're going to communicate afferently to my Medulla oblongata. That's going to activate which sympathetic nervous system? Which last time we said that's a cardioaccelatory center, right? So activate the sympathetic nerves to target the SA node to increase my. We act on the node to change the heart rate to increase it. We also act on the myocardium to increase contractility. So my rate and stroke volume go up, so my, what else increases? Your cardiac output. And a lot of my blood vessels will probably constrict. So I increase cardiac output, I increase resistance, so that hopefully my blood pressure goes up to that point. Dual innervation, Antagonistic set point, right? All those terms that we've been leading up to, right? Illustrated here for neural control over blood pressure. And that certainly controls our blood pressure 
uh, and a quick, all right, we can make adjustments really quickly. But if we have a history of blood pressure uh, hypertension or hypotension, we're going to call in some hormones and target the kidneys. And so we're going to put that concept on hold uh, to uh, next week when we look at the renal physiology. Before we move on, um, what questions do you have over this, this reflex? Before we All right, the next image I'm going to show is just also hopefully a review and concept. Um, uh, those events that we just talked about, table 14.4, should illustrate the opposite effect of the um, parasympathetic versus the sympathetic fibers that we brought. I noticed this yesterday, but it looks like it's correct in your um, textbook. This image that I have is incorrect. We should see an opposing effect between the sympathetic and parasympathetic because we've got your... Yesterday's class checked it and said it's correct in the book, so I don't know what happened here. But the sympathetic nervous system should certainly increase heart rate, but the parasympathetic we know decreases uh, our heart rate to have the life effect on our blood pressure. Um, this table also illustrates that the bulk share of our vessels are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system and how the vessel constricts, the blood pressure should increase, and the blood vessel dilates, the blood pressure should decrease. All right, so that reflex that we talked about is summarized a bit here in Table 14.4. And another um, culminative type image is Figure 14.2, illustrating the blood distribution. Uh, what are we looking at? Um, we're looking at... distribution, I guess, uh, of blood flow uh, to skeletal muscles, our total cardiac output, our heart rate, um, and etc. during uh, light exercise. And certainly during exercise, we know that a bulk of our blood should be redistributed to our skeletal muscles because those are going to be utilizing uh, more of, of the blood and its oxygen content so that we can power that muscle activity. Uh, you also see an increase in stroke volume and heart rate, which has a compounding effect on our cardiac output. So if you exercise, heart rate goes up, stroke volume goes up, cardiac output increases. Blood pressure should go up some, and not necessarily like you're running a marathon or something like that. It should go up a little bit. And our blood is our end diastolic volume. That means, what is the end diastolic volume? Just before you pump it out. So as it fills, so as it fills, it fills up a little more, which also contributes to our greater stroke volume. So it's proportional, which makes sense. All those factors should increase if we increase our activity. Now it looks like that concludes our chapter 14 presentation. Um, what I wanted to do is go ahead and get into the respiratory system. All right. So again, chapter 16 and 17 is uh, going to discuss the respiratory system. We're going to look at first the anatomy and correlate that with uh, the physiology of these structures. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do in, uh, for our chapter objectives is we're going to look at internal versus external respiration. We've not used these terms yet. We're also going to review um, the structure and function of the conducting versus the respiratory zone, which you have also had an introduction to, thanks to uh, the handout. We're going to review again the role of pulmonary surfactant, also introduced in lab. We're going to also look at the physical um, events of inspiration and expiration, a review from lab. So we're going to look at physically what happens during in, uh, what we can call ventilation. We're also going to make a connection to air pressure and air resistance to the flow of blood, to the flow of air through the lungs. So the relationship between pressure gradient and resistance will be very similar uh, to the flow of air, like we saw the flow of blood. So the concepts should be repetitive. All right. So if we look at uh, what we're going to study, it's still all about the what? Still all about the gradient. This time we need a gas pressure gradient because we want to do what? 
Yes, we want to breathe, but we want to, what do we, why do we need a gradient? We want to move air. We want to move air into the lungs. We want to move air out of the lungs. And we want to move oxygen into our tissues and carbon dioxide out of our tissues. Okay, so we need pressure gradient so that we can move the air. Uh, air is still a fluid, so it still flows by the, uh, uses the fluid dynamic right, properties that we've been introduced to in the vessels. Okay. Um, if we look at, look at uh, figure 16.1, this is going to summarize um, anatomically where some major phases of respiration happen. So, again, this isn't necessarily a great image for projection, uh, so um, it may be a bit larger in your text. Let me just put this in, in perspective. On the very top, we have the lungs. On the very, even above that, could represent the outside of the body. And then the capillaries serving the lungs would be the pulmonary capillaries. And so that makes sense because this is coming from the right side of the heart. So we have our pulmonary capillaries. And then we have our systemic circuit on the lower portion of the image. And we know that our systemic circuit serves our body tissues. Okay? So this could be your brain or your muscles or your skin or whatever. And on the very bottom of the image, it's picking one cell out and saying, well, that cell, like the rest of your cells in your body, are metabolizing, using oxygen, producing carbon dioxide, heat, hormones, whatever. Okay? And so if we were to break this up into the two major right, components, moving the air between, and the gases, between the external environment from the atmosphere to your systemic capillaries is collectively referred to as external respiration. So we're just trying to move a gas from the atmosphere to the body or from the body to the atmosphere. Right. So it's not what's happening uh, at the systemic tissues. It's everything preceding and, and afterwards. It's called external respiration. If we look at the exchange between the systemic capillaries in our tissues, we could then probably call this what? Okay. Internal respiration. We're exchanging with the tissues and your systemic circuit. Okay. We could look at uh, what's happening in external respiration. Physically moving air into and out of the lungs. What is that called? We can call that ventilation. Ventilation is just moving air in and out of the lungs. Or I could say really it's two, two sub-phases of ventilation include. You can say inhalation or inspiration. Or expiration or exhalation. Inspiration and expiration. Inhale, exhale is how we can carry out ventilation, venting the lungs. It is in ventilation that we are can see that we can use the term bulk flow again. We're not moving blood, but we're moving air. Okay. And so bulk flow is the net in inspiration and, and expiration, moving our, our gases. Be aware that during ventilation, you're not taking in exclusively oxygen and you're not pushing out exclusively carbon dioxide. You're going to take in a mixture of whatever's in the air. The bulk of our atmosphere is which gas? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Yeah, nearly 79% of our atmosphere. So when you take a breath in, you're taking in a lot of nitrogen. But you're also taking in a higher proportion of oxygen when you're, you're exhaling. Right? So it's just anything exposed to that pressure gradient can be inspired or expired, right? So another right, gross example is like if you cough something productive like you're sick, right? That's not carbon dioxide, but it came from your lungs, but it was exposed to the pressure gradient. Okay. And so the same thing, you could inhale a dust particle or, or something like that. Once air, once the lungs are ventilated, we want to exclusively have a gradient to push oxygen from the alveoli into your pulmonary capillaries. And that's where you guys were reviewing in your handout. We need a what? A gradient. 
so that pressure is higher in your alveoli than where? Than in those pulmonary capillaries. And the reverse is true for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide pressure should be higher in your pulmonary capillaries than in your alve alveoli. Should move right out. Once the gases, um, we are going to see an exchange between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries. And once the gases are um, exchanged, we need to transport them. So we'll pick this, uh, pick this up at the end of this chapter, I do believe. But you have an idea about transport, transportation of at least carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is transported in the blood how? It gets converted. You guys are all correct. Right? It can be it can combine with water to form carbonic acid, which then can dissociate into a carbon ion. So we have an idea about carbon dioxide, how it's transported. The bulk of it is converted to a carbon ion. So we're going to add a few things to there. Even without having watched the chapter 15 lecture, you know that oxygen is carried how? Transported down to hemoglobin. Right? The bulk of it is down to hemoglobin. So we'll, come, we'll conclude the chapter with the transport of the gas. So some of it we're familiar with. Once the gases are transported, they can go to the systemic tissues where we can have another exchange. Where we still need another what? Gradient. Pressure gradient. Okay. And within a cell, within the systemic tissue, a cell can carry out cellular respiration, which we would have covered in chapter three. Taking in oxygen, using it in which organelle? Mitochondria, good job. And producing which gas? Carbon dioxide. Quick quiz. Which phases produce carbon dioxide? Citric acid. Yeah. Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, and the leaky step. Good job. So that carbon dioxide is produced during the linking step and during the Krebs cycle. Creates, contributes to that pressure gradient. Let carbon dioxide out of the tissue and oxygen into the tissue. Where then those gases can be transported and then externally released with the carbon dioxide. So the, the point of this image is to illustrate there's a lot going on in respiration. It's more than just ventilation. We, our external respiration also includes the transport of the gases to and fro the, uh, the pulmonary circuit to the systemic circuit. And then internal respiration is getting uh, that gas exchange between the systemic circuit and your, and your uh, peripheral tissues. But we're still using a gradient. So while we're here on this image, let's, let's, let's um, now, actually let's put numbers here too. If I want to move, which gas do I want to move here? Oxygen, so the pressure should be least inside of the tissue. From your homework, from your handout, what is the what is the average pressure of oxygen in any tissue for uh, oxygen? Yes, inside of some body cell, the partial pressure of oxygen is about forty. It's about forty. And we're still in uh, millimeters mercury. Since I want to move oxygen into my tissue, the pressure in my systemic capillary should be greater than that. So what's the partial pressure of oxygen in my systemic capillary? About 100 millimeters, millimeters mercury. And I have a gradient. Yes. 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 
we're gonna hopefully hopefully get to that. Okay. I'm just kind of getting the motor cranked okay. a little bit. So let's 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 sew our systemic circuit, our systemic capillaries, and then she can write this down. Systemic capillary pressure is at the top or the bottom end. The bottom end. So systemic capillary oxygen pressure is about 100. Systemic tissue is it's about 40. So we have a gradient of about 60. Oxygen's pushed. That gradient's huge. It's pushed from your blood to your systemic tissues. You're okay? Are you okay? Yeah. What about the pressure in my tissues for carbon dioxide? What's the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in my tissues? Carbon dioxide pressure inside of my tissues is going to be relatively it's about 46 millimeters of mercury. In my tissues, but in my systemic circuit, the pressure of carbon dioxide is about how much? About 40. So, bigger number, higher pressure, gases will move which way? Well, just in general, gases will move down their gradient. So, oxygen moves from where it's bigger to where it's less. So, oxygen moves from your Capillary to your tissues. Carbon dioxide, the pressure gradient's not as giant, but it's still there. So it's at about 46 millimeters mercury in your tissue and about 40 in your systemic capillary. So the gradient exists. It'll move from where it's in higher pressure in your tissues to where it's in lesser pressure in your systemic circuit. I add a gas to a, to a solution, the pressure of that gas in the solution should go up. And if I take a gas out, the pressure in that solution would decrease. Okay. You take, it gets bigger, you take away, or if you take away, the pressure drops. If you give, the pressure gets bigger. And so if I just added carbon dioxide into my blood, the blood pressure, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide should be a little bit. Higher. So by the time, so we can answer the first top part of the of the that image. The pressure of carbon dioxide in my pulmonary capillaries is about how much? I just added something to it. It's about 46 in my pulmonary capillaries. So inside of the blood vessel, the pressure of carbon dioxide is about 46 millimeters of mercury. And in my lungs, the pressure of carbon dioxide is about how much? It's about 40. We happen to have another what? Another gradient. So carbon dioxide diffuses from your, which capillaries? Pulmonary capillaries into your alveoli. And I also happen to have a gradient. We just took oxygen out, so my pressure in my systemic capillaries for oxygen has decreased. And so if we were to measure over the pulmonary capillaries, my pressure of oxygen is about how much? It's about, uh, how much is it? About 40, is that right? In my pulmonary capillaries, but in my alveoli, the pressure for oxygen is hopefully about hopefully about 100 millimeters of mercury. Hopefully, it's just a, a big. Measure of oxygen as we deep breath in. So we have a gradient. So oxygen will flow from where? So really be pushed from the alveoli to your pulmonary capillaries. You had a nice flex. Great. Riley, does that help at all? Yes. I the systemic capillaries, that's what I'm confused. Systemic capillaries mean body tissues. Okay. Where you want oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. Pulmonary capillaries is where you want 
oxygen into those capillaries and carbon dioxide out of it. So the value that you should have on your um, on that handout are going to be 140 for oxygen and 46 and 40 for carbon dioxide. In the directionality, right, we should be able to handle the oxygen in the tissues and into the pulmonary capillary in the reverse for carbon dioxide. While, we, while we've kind of just put the card ahead of ourselves, um, what questions do you have or clarification do you need about these gradients that exist at these tissues? Keep it simple. You want oxygen in your tissues, so the number should be... If I want oxygen in my tissues, the, the number for oxygen for... Pressure for oxygen should be lower in those tissues. Those tissues are active, and so they should be making carbon dioxide, so the pressure should be high. And then if we want to reverse with the lungs, the pressure for carbon dioxide in the lungs should be low, because I want to put the carbon dioxide into my lungs, and I want to take the oxygen, so the pressure in, of oxygen in your lungs should be really high. Oxygen in, good. Uh, carbon dioxide out, good, right? All right, and if you need help with that, certainly bring those questions on Tuesday. We can start thinking about that. Uh, if we go through some respiratory structures, we can functionally divide or anatomically divide the, uh, the respiratory system into the conducting versus the respiratory zones. The conducting zone right, gives itself away. What does it do? It, it conducts, it moves air. And then the respiratory zone, what happens here? Gas exchange. Unloading. Oxygen to the pulmonary capillaries and loading uh, carbon dioxide into the alveoli. And so your conducting zones include organs maybe you didn't necessarily think about. So the, the, the nose, the mouth, um, the trachea, and the bronchi, which lead up to the respiratory zone. So let's go through and look at some anatomical, anatomical features of each of these zones. So the the basic anatomy of these structures is summarized in figure 16.3. Uh, the larynx to the back of the mouth, the trachea, the bronchi are left and their right lungs are independent one another. And we can see this sorting off uh, here. And so um, this ties into the homework, or excuse me, the lab that we had. And so what would happen if you blocked one lung? Your tidal volume would be about, what, half, because you have two lungs. Stop using one of the other. Subtracting out the panic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other lungs should still work fine. Okay? But uh, so we have the trachea, the main stem, or what's described here as the primary bronchi, and then we have the secondary tertiary that's called smaller, and this really gets the terminal bronchioles. And at the very end, highlighted here in green, are the respiratory zones. I want to turn your attention to not the name, but the diameter of the lumen of these conducting zones. A similar feature that we saw in the blood vessels also is detectable here in the respiratory system. In that, we see a significant drop in diameter intermediate, not at the end, but somewhere in the middle. Why did we see a drop in blood flow and blood pressure in our, in our vasculature? If you can't answer the question why, at least maybe let's answer which vessels, where we see this drop in pressure. It's the arterioles that drop the blood pressure significantly. But you're correct in that the pressure continues to decline through the system. But we see the steepest drop in pressure and velocity in these arterioles. So that by the time the blood gets to the capillaries, 
the pressure is not so damaging to the capillary. You will see a similar decline in diameter in the respiratory system, not at the beginning, not at the end, but in the middle. Because same concept, we don't want to do what? We don't want to pop those alveoli. We want the airflow to be nice and steady when it gets to the terminal alveoli. Okay, so let's turn our attention then to the diameter. The larynx, the greatest diameter. Okay, so about 35 to 45. Uh, millimeters in diameter, obviously larger people, right? larger trachea diameter, um, larynx, and then the trachea as well. And so you, you can physically palpate right, how big your trachea is. So it's pretty large right, diameter. By the time the air gets into these bronchi, that uh, diameter is cut down to about almost half. Okay, so, um, and then we continue to see a slight decline uh, in the secondary and the same thing in the tertiary. But if you notice, there's a major drop in diameter, and what's described here is a smaller bronchi. So the airflow is going to kind of get bottleneck, really, the most at the smaller bronchi. So if the airflow is nice and steady, by the time it gets down to the terminal uh, and the, what's called the respiratory bronchiole, so even though the diameter is tiny here, the most significant drop in the diameter is before the air gets to the alveoli. Does that, does that correlation make sense where we need to slow it down before we, we're slowing down velocity and also just the, the force of the air. So that, what can happen at the alveoli? Well, we don't want them to burst. And so we slow the air down so that we can just have enough time to exchange push oxygen out into the pulmonary capillaries and absorb carbon dioxide into the alveoli. Uh, not shown here is um, your pulmonary capillaries, but they would just be completely just almost encasing your alveoli and your respiratory, right? So your whole respiratory zone is completely encompassed with pulmonary capillaries. We want to have a lot of surface area for a whole lot of gas exchange. We want oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. What questions do you have about correlating this anatomy to the physiology of these, these structures? Okay. I'm going to now turn our attention to figure 16.5C. Again, also you had a, a little bit of a warm-up uh, looking at uh, your handout that you'll turn in today. This is a single alveolus. We know that the bulk of the alveoli is comprised of what type of cells? The type 1 alveolar cells. Okay. The type 1 alveolar cells make up the structure of uh, the alveolus. So it's these little... Uh, rectangular looking flaps, right? Like cells. And these are all type 1 cells. We also have type 2 cells. What color are they in this image? The green things are the type 2 cells. And we know that these do what? Secrete surfactant, whose job is to, surfactant's job is to reduce surface tension. So these two make up the structure of a given alveolus. You will also find a high proportion of another set of cells which are colored purple here. What are those cells? These are called macrophages, a type of what? A what? Yes, yes, but yes. They said eating and Pac-Man. So what cells do that? What kind of cell? Do what? They're immune cells, right? So, so specialized white blood cells, and they and the word is phagocytose. You have a lot of uh, macrophages in your alveoli to give you a first line of defense. And as I mentioned a moment ago, anything in the atmosphere can go straight into your lungs. Okay, so um, without a line of defense there. They're going to be really susceptible to illness every time you breathe, and we don't, right? 
We don't like that, so let's, they have some uh, immune cells in stations. So the alveoli, uh, the macrophages, 